Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Mary Angela Saavedra, the director of the Center on the Hill, and this is Speaker Series on the Hill Online. Um, today, I'm very excited to be introducing to you a special guest. His name is Eric Gershnow. Um, he happens to be my husband, and he's been wanting to come and talk uh, to us about the future of medicine, the emergence of cell and gene therapies for a while. So I'm really excited to have him here, um, even if this is the way we get to do it. So I hope you enjoy listening to him. Uh, just a little bit of background. He currently works as an associate principal scientist at Wuxi Advanced Therapies in South Philadelphia. So he's going to tell us a little bit about what he does and talk about the emergence of cell and gene therapies. Eric? Well, thank you, Mary Angela, very much. Yes, indeed. Uh, so I'll go jump right into the, the first slide here. Uh, again, welcome, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well at this uh, time that we're currently managing the, the COVID-19 epidemic. Hopefully some of the, the content that we'll be talking about here will maybe give you some insight into you know, vaccine development, because there's a lot of similarities between vaccine development and uh, gene therapy. But first, I'm going to start with a brief introduction about myself. I know Mary Angela already introduced me, but I'll talk a little bit about my history. And then we'll talk about a brief history of uh, cell and gene therapy, kind of where the roots of that start from, and then where we are today. And then talk about more of the, the specific mechanisms that we develop from the scientific realm that, that feed into uh, how we design some of these therapies and what are the specific applications or indications for these therapies. Touching on specifically what's called CAR T cell therapy for immunocancer treatment. And then we'll uh, take a step back and look at a 10,000 foot view of, of the, say the drug development industry and some of the, the, the challenges that are associated with getting a drug from initial discovery phase to an actual commercial product that we can then you know, send off to patients to, to treat illnesses. Again, I, I come from a background steeped in, in pharma industry. I graduated with a bachelor's degree from Shippensburg University in straight chemistry, but then when I got out into the field, all the all the jobs were in the pharma industry. So that's kind of where I got my start. I have uh, about 20 years, it's actually 20 years plus now, going on uh, working in the pharmaceutical industry. And principally, a lot of my role has been focused on supporting applications around protein-based and more recently gene therapy-based type drugs with the principal focus on what's called process development. So process development looks at from the initial conception of the drug how do we take that and then develop a process where we can then deliver that drug either in a vial or a pill directly to a patient, either on your pharmacy shelf or in a hospital setting? My personal experience, I've done a lot of work using approaches in small scale experimental design and then translating those approaches to a manufacturing scale. I'm not going to get into some of my publications, presentations. This is just here for reference, but I've spent a lot of time steeped in this particular industry. So to switch gears now and, and talk a little bit about the history of cell and gene therapy, well, specifically cell therapy first, this all began really at the turn of the 20th century. So after the Civil War, you had this massive industrial revolution that occurred towards the later half of the 19th century, early 20th century. You start to see radical advances in all aspects of industry, but in particular, in um, drug development and in, in new technologies tied to medicine and how we can treat patients. So the cell therapy approach really arose from particularly two individuals. One's Alexis Carell, who's a Nobel Prize winner for some of the surgical techniques that he established that we still use today. And he had proposed at that time the idea of using healthy tissues within a patient's body, their own tissues, to potentially heal or treat damaged tissues. Similarly, Swiss doctor Paul Niehans actually had done work as a surgeon. In a particular case, he actually damaged a patient's parathyroid, which a parathyroid, uh, one of its functions is hormone regulation. And as a result, this patient had horrible seizures. So Dr. Niehans thought of taking calf cells he had actually been working with, parathyroid calf cells, and then administering them directly to the patient with reported success, though we know based on current FDA regulations, this would be a, uh, a no-go in the pharma industry. But again, this is sort of the early stages of, 
the conception of cell therapy and how we could potentially use those to treat patient illnesses. So what am I talking about when I say cell therapy? So in terms of the actual process, what are we doing here? It typically starts with cells that were recovering from either a healthy donor, which we refer to allogeneic, or directly from the patient that requires treatment, which we refer to as autologous. And I'll get into sort of the differences between those two and how those impact how we say take approaches to manufacturing and delivering these therapies to people. But once we've recovered those tissues from a patient, then we look at selectively targeting those cells of interest that we pull from those tissues. And then we can either do one of two things. We either can um, generate what's called a cell bank where we can chemically modify these cells to make them immortal. It's a very sci-fi thing, but we can, we can keep these cells alive indefinitely. And then what we do is we can either take clones of those cells or if we take them directly from the patient, we would then look to grow them or expand them in a bioreactor, similar to the way you brew beer. And then from that bioreactor, we'll recover those cells and then treat the patient with them. Here's a, a list of some FDA approved cell therapies that are currently on the market. I'm not gonna go through every single one here. This slide here is just for reference primarily, but just wanted to familiarize yourselves with, with some of the the approaches that we're using for cell therapy, a lot of these are actually blood derived. So there's not a whole lot of work that's being done on say the pharmaceutical side, again, because the product is the patient's cells themselves. It's really just the approach of taking those cells and isolating them and then growing them up. But in, again, in many cases, a lot of these are blood derived products that um, if you've ever heard of like blood platelet therapy, where we can take a patient's blood sample and we can use a technique called centrifugation to actually separate various components within the bloodstream and then isolate and concentrate those blood platelets, which are responsible for repairing damage and administer those directly to a patient. So to get into gene therapy, and this is really my area of particular interest, this is where my focus is, and this to me is uh, way more exciting, not, not, not to dash cell therapy in any way, but the history of gene therapy, again, starts in the early 20th century and perhaps not as crude as compared to some of the surgical techniques. Uh, it, it all starts with two individuals, Edward Tatum and George Beadle, who were geneticists who won a Nobel Prize for some of the work that they had done looking at the interactions of various microbes and how microbes can actually adapt by sharing or the term that we use is conjugate their DNA in order to create a whole new line of cells that in some cases, if we think about antibiotics and resistance, that's the concern. And that's why when a doctor gives you a, a bottle of antibiotics, you make sure you take them throughout the entire course. Otherwise, you could have bacteria that learn to grow and adapt and overcome those antibiotics. But in terms of gene therapy, we're thinking about this ability to modify the genetic component to allow a patient to either recover or heal completely uh, from an illness. It wasn't until really Joshua Led Lederberg, who was actually uh, one of the co-recipients of this Nobel Prize, who he himself was a geneticist as well as um, he had areas focused in artificial intelligence, but really proposed the idea, and this is very key here, the idea of using a virus as a transport mechanism for genetic material. So it wasn't really until the 50s that you started to see uh, with the development of vaccines that we were looking at genetically altering viruses in a way, uh, and this is specifically attenuating them so that they don't elicit a strong immune response in order to develop vaccines. But it was in the 70s where you started to see the emergence of uh, using these for gene therapy applications and into the 90s when you actually started to see uh, clinical trials around these. So some of you may have heard, uh, and this is really the big push for gene therapies, why? Why look at gene therapies? If you've ever heard of the boy in the bubble, uh, and I'm referring specifically to a young gentleman by the name of uh, David Vetter, who unfortunately passed away at a very young age due to um, a disease called adenosine deaminase severe combined immunodeficiency, or ADA SIDS. In this particular case, this is a genetic anomaly in which uh, due to one single gene missing where uh, the immune system doesn't kick in. 
So it doesn't recognize pathogens or, or, or foreign bodies. An average human who may say normally be immune to, but in this case, folks who suffer from this condition, it's similar to AIDS in that their immune system is completely compromised. They have no defense against pathogens. And people who suffer from this illness tend to have chronic illness and typically die if untreated. This, with a host of other sort of genetic conditions that have come up or have been identified over the past few decades, this really has been the big push uh, to look at investigating gene therapy approaches. So what is the mechanism of gene therapy? Okay, I can throw the term out gene therapy, but what does it mean exactly? And this is why I think this is so, so cool stuff. We're actually looking at manipulating by treating illness, manipulating a patient's genetic code, specifically to target sequences that are either missing or defective in order to treat an illness. So in a way, we're switching from historically used protein applications that treat symptoms. So a lot of the therapies that are on the market now, we treat symptoms. We're actually looking at treating the root cause of the illness here by either genetically modifying the patient directly or indirectly using a host of different techniques. One is using, um, say, DNA, which can exist as what I call naked DNA, which people recognize as the double helix, or DNA can exist in what's called a plasmid. So it exists as a ring. And this particular DNA sequence is targeted, say, to replace or repair those sequences that are deficient in the patient. Another approach, which I just mentioned briefly, is using a virus or what are, what's actually called a viral vector. So it's slightly different than a virus. It looks like a virus, but rather than say infecting a patient with a viral DNA to propagate more virus, we're actually engineering these so that the genetic material inside the virus is actually delivering say the gene of interest that we want to deliver to the patient, either again, directly or indirectly. Other approaches use what are called DNA modifying proteins. Proteins are components, again, they're, they're, they're all throughout your bloodstream. They're all derived from your cellular DNA. And each protein, if you think of it like a, a lock and key mechanism, proteins are catalysts for all the chemical reactions in your body. Everything that your body does is driven by uh, chemical reactions facilitated by proteins. Also, that includes modifying DNA. So we can use proteins for this purpose. But for this talk, I'm really going to be focusing on viral vectors primarily. So again, what is a viral vector? It's like a virus, but it's not exactly. So how do we make a viral vector? Well, viral vectors, again, they're derived from viruses, but they're not exactly viruses. We can use an analogy comparing packaging a virus to how we would package, like say Amazon would package a, something that you would purchase to ship to you, right? So there's there's the box and the label, that's the packaging elements. And then there's the actual thing that you want delivered that goes in the box. Similarly, we use plasmids. Again, these are DNA components that code for specific elements that go into manufacturing this viral vector. Some of those components are surface proteins, which are very important and we'll talk about. Structural proteins, the structural proteins are like the box that you're putting the DNA in or you're putting the package in. And then you have plasmids tied to, say, the therapeutic gene of interest and other, say, genetic elements that express various proteins that facilitate in the, the delivery of that genetic material. So instead of having an Amazon factory to package all the stuff together for you, we actually rely on cells in a bioreactor. So we'll use a virus in various plasmids, and then we'll inoculate these cells to then reprogram them to start manufacturing viral vectors. So you have an image here of a viral vector on your right, on the bottom of the screen, and you can see there's this lovely little uh, hexagonal shape. This is the actual surface proteins that are the packaging, and these little spindles that are sticking out of it, those are the surface proteins. Those are very important because those are sort of like the key that unlock the cell in order for the virus to enter and actually deliver the gene of interest. Again, this slide is just to emphasize that when I'm talking about viral vectors, these are 
different than viruses. Viruses, which this is just a panel of various viruses that we actually use as part of testing for other therapeutics to ensure that we're not transmitting these to patients. But viral vectors are derived, elements are derived from these, but they are not viruses. And we program these viral vectors so that they don't become infective or don't propagate in a way that can cause uh, an immune response in the patient. So the approach that once we have a viral vector then, the whole process of the gene therapy approach would be very similar to the cell therapy approach. We would derive tissues from the patient. And this is in the case of what I'm calling CAR T cell therapy, and I'll explain that a little bit. But we can take cells directly from the patient and select those cells of interest. In many cases, we're looking at targeting the immune cells. And then we'll take the viral vector and then we'll transduce those cells or treat those cells in such a way that now we've delivered this genetic modification to these cells, and then we reinsert these cells back into the patient. Now, the key, and what I mentioned about allogenic, which is from a healthy donor versus autologous, the big difference here is in terms of manufacturing, ideally, the industry would like to selectively use allogenic cells as much as possible versus autologous. The reason for that has to do specifically with how we can deliver these therapies in, in a way that sort of one size fits all. If you consider we can get cells from a healthy donor that can be used for any number of patients, well, then that allows us to simplify our manufacturing process and again, create something that's a one size fits all. If we're doing an autologous approach, it's going to be a one at a time sort of approach and the timelines for those uh, can be actually quite lengthy in being able to deliver these therapies to patients. So a, a lot of this sort of ties in with the bigger picture and the costs associated with manufacturing uh, gene and cell therapies. And right now, even though there are a number of FDA approved drugs on the market, uh, a lot of them are very expensive for this reason. But again, ideally, we'd like to move to an allergenic approach and to be able to, to take these cells from a healthy donor that we could apply to a larger population. In some cases, we can actually take those uh, viral vectors and apply them directly to the patient. So I mentioned either directly or indirectly. Uh, in terms of uh, the efficacy of these drugs, you know, again, the reason why we're pursuing these is the, the potential impact and value of quality of life to patients is dramatically huge. Uh, a case in point uh, we're referencing here, and this is actually a similar um, case to the, the boy in the bubble here, the ADA SIDS, and this is actually um, a, a patient named Ashanti De Silva, who in the 90s had received gene therapy treatment using a, a very similar to approach that I just described. And uh, ever since, you can see this is a picture of her on the bottom right here. She is a, a grown adult, happy and healthy, 100% uh, in remission. Uh, it's one thing about these gene therapy treatments, it's quite unique. It's, it's a one and done treatment. So it's, it's huge compared to the way uh, the current approaches in the drug industry where, again, we, we get a prescription for a drug that we have to take routinely, either daily or uh, uh, every other day to treat the symptoms of an illness. Here, we're actually looking at treating the illness at its source. So huge implications for patient quality of life, singular treatment, one and done. Uh, in terms of the indications, it's everything under the sun from cancer, uh, inherited genetic diseases, diabetes, which is, is quite ubiquitous, arthritis, uh, you name it. Uh, and, and it employs a lot of innovative approaches. You know, this is a rapidly expanding market. It's really, really small right now. I'm pretty excited to be a part of it because I feel like I'm coming in at the ground level here. And I only expect that this is going to continue and grow and get bigger. And I think the key thing to differentiate this from a lot of therapies on the market is that we're actually using the patient's own tissues. We're sourcing the tissues from the patients to treat the patients themselves. So it's, it's a huge shift from the way we've been treating uh, illnesses with, with medicines thus far. But this excitement has been tempered, at least in the initial onset, uh, when we're looking at some of the uh, clinical trials that started back in the 90s, we had a few hiccups, and I use that term lightly, but I mean, we're talking about patients' lives here, and it's really important that any drug that we're testing, any drug, goes through 
rigorous uh, qualification as far as safety. That's a huge part of clinical trials before we even look at efficacy. But one of the initial clinical trials, and this involved a gentleman by the uh, name of Jesse Gelsinger, who suffered from a, a, a unique um, deficiency that I think it, it prevented his liver from being able to process uh, ammonia, but was treated using a very similar approach for gene therapy and died, unfortunately, uh, from a very acute immune response. So again, this is the early days of gene therapy. Uh, in this particular case, uh, there's a lot of unknowns involved here. And again, the way the body responds to the presence of a viral vector, even though it's not a virus, there's still some risk, at least in the initial design and implementation of these therapies that caused uh, a really strong immune response. Similarly to Jolie Moore, who was receiving a, a vector that was being administered directly to her uh, for an arthritis application where she had a secondary reaction that then caused immune response that unfortunately led to her demise. But as a result of that, the FDA stepped in quite quickly, put a halt to these, cl these clinical trials, and really pushed back on um, some of these manufacturers to go back to the drawing board. To mention, Jesse Gelsinger was actually treated right here at UPenn in Philadelphia at Jim Wilson's lab. So one of the things, and I'll talk about this a little bit, but Philadelphia, I consider this to be a really unique location to be in. I, myself, my family live here in Philadelphia. You have both University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that are actively looking at targeting various gene therapy applications for orphan diseases and licensing a lot of those technologies to various pharma companies. So you're starting to see now, decades after these initial clinical trials, uh, once there's a lot of rigorous testing to look at safety and efficacy, now that we've gotten some thumbs up from the FDA, a lot of pharma companies are looking to license IP from both UPenn and CHOP and are actually moving into the Philadelphia area to set up laboratories and expand their capabilities. So to that point, uh, again, the decade following those initial clinical trials, there was a, a lot of concern around safety. So going back to the drawing board and redesigning some of these vectors, we've been able to sort of move past that hurdle and effectively design these types of therapies so that we don't elicit an immune response. And really it's looking at targeting efficacy at this point. And the FDA recognizes that and sees the value in this. So a lot of the gene therapy candidates that are currently in clinical trials right now, and just using Juno Therapeutics as an example here, this is again for a CAR T cell approach, that even in the case where in some of the clinical trials, they were suspended from deaths that had occurred as part of the population, just within a matter of days, the FDA came back and gave uh, Juno the green light to continue doing their clinical trials. So that's quite huge. It's really un, uh, unprecedented for the FDA to, to be able to turn that kind of response back around in such a short time period. But it, it just goes to show you how, how much weight, how much value the FDA sees in these gene therapy type um, uh, therapeutics. So a lot of these that get, after they get um, what's called IND filing or initial drug discovery filing before you go into clinical trials, a lot of these drugs will start to get what they call fast track status that allows them to push these through clinical trials a little bit faster to deliver these to patients. So this slide here gives us a, a 10,000 foot view of sort of the indications that are actually currently ongoing right now in clinical trials for a lot of the gene therapies that are uh, under investigation right now. And you can see a huge chunk of those are actually dedicated to uh, cancer treatment. Uh, the next largest size of that is hematology and ophthalmology. But it's the cancer treatment, I think, that's gotten a lot of attention just because of how ubiquitous cancer is. I'm sure just about everyone watching here has probably known someone, a family member, a friend who has dealt with cancer and the, the, the impact that cancer can have. Uh, you can see here, uh, it, it's, it, it was such a high, high profile thing for, for gene therapy when it hit for cancer treatment that it actually made the cover of Time Magazine here. And, and I believe in this particular issue, it touched on the application for melanoma, which actually Jimmy Carter was treated with a CAR T cell therapy approach and has been in remission from skin cancer. <laughs> 
Just a, a brief timeline here on the history of cancer treatment. Some folks may be familiar with already, but it, again, wasn't really until the 80s that you started to see the emergence of immunotherapy treatments. And actually, a lot of this was sort of spurred by uh, bone marrow transplants, quite interestingly enough. Uh, in the particular case that was observed with bone marrow transplants, say when you remove bone marrow from one patient and donate it to another person, not only are you carrying the, the, the tissues that are, are, are essential for generating blood and blood platelets, but you're also transferring that individual's immune system into a patient's. So it's so critical that we match bone marrow. Otherwise, um, the immune system that's being transplanted doesn't recognize the own patient, the recipient's tissues. So then you start to have these uh, adverse reactions that require uh, immunosuppressant drugs to treat. That was the early days of bone marrow transplants. But once we started matching patients properly, one thing that we started to see happen was when we transplanted from a healthy donor into a recipient, not only we would see cancer go into remission, but if there was any cancer that would develop later on, there were some cases where we would see the, the immune system would kick in and actually fight and attack those cancers. So that's sort of what led the path down gene therapy as a means for treating cancer. And again, it wasn't until the 90s that you started to see investigations into, into therapies to actually target gene therapy approaches for cancer treatment. So here's a, a brief list again of some of the, the, the drugs that are actually FDA approved. It's a very small handful, but the ones that I really wanted to touch on more specifically in regards to cancer treatment, when I mentioned the term CAR T cell, CAR T cell stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell. In this particular case, what we're doing is using a viral vector, instead of administering these directly to the patient, we take a patient's T cells, their immune cells, we take them out of the patient, isolate them, and then we treat them with a viral vector. And what the viral vector does is it mutates or genetically upgrades the T cell to identify, to be able to identify specific, very specific surface proteins that are on cancer cells. Now, the challenge with cancer historically has been because cancer cells are derived from the patient's own cells, they're mutated patient cells that go astray. The purpose here is to be able to distinguish unique markers of cancer cells that differentiate them from a patient's normal healthy tissue. Using CAR T cell, we can upgrade a patient's immune cells or their immune system to then recognize cancer and then effectively attack it and kill it. So that's pretty huge. Uh, and of the treatments that have been done thus far, again, uh, gene therapy is a one and done treatment. Like I mentioned, the treatment that was highlighted in the Time Magazine article about Jimmy Carter, he has been in remission ever since. But there are a number of other notable FDA approved gene therapies that are on the market. Notably, one uh, is Lexterna, that's actually FDA approved from Spark Therapeutics, which is right here in the city of Philadelphia. Spark Therapeutics is actually a spinoff of the uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They're right on Market Street and just recently had been acquired by Roche because of their FDA approval for the Lex Turner, which is a, a retinal disease treatment. So let's take a, a moment and step back away from just gene therapy, cell therapy, and, and talk about the sort of the drug industry in general, just to give everyone a sense and understanding of how the process by which we initially discover uh, an indication of a drug, to actually being able to, to carry it through clinical trials uh, into a space where we can actually manufacture it and get FDA approval so that we can then commercialize these drugs and, and make them available to patients. And just looking at the timeline here, you can see just from initial studies, uh, once we find a, a potential therapeutic that demonstrates a measure of efficacy, then we file what's called an IND application or an initial drug discovery application uh, with the FDA. Once we do that and get approval, then we can start moving towards what are called clinical trials. So you have three phases of clinical trials. The first two are looking at 
just sort of a general broad population, and we're not really looking so much at the efficacy of the drug. The focus of phase one and phase two is primarily focused on the health and safety of the patient to ensure that as we administer these therapies, we're not adversely impacting the patient. That's number one, patient safety. So oftentimes you'll see drugs will make it past phase one with no issues. It's really more in the phase two and phase three where we start to really look at uh, narrowing the population down to patients who are actually suffering from these illnesses that these therapies are targeted for to look at the efficacy, the impact, and whether or not we can actually push these drugs through for FDA approval and then to, to, to effectively manufacture these and distribute these to a large population. So just looking at the phases for each uh, segment within clinical trials, you can see these, these take months, sometimes years, just to get testing done, to get results back, to compile those results. All, it's all about building a case to justify to the FDA that we can safely manufacture, administer, and get positive results from these drugs. So I'm sure there's a lot of folks who, who may have, heard, been, again, keeping their ear to a lot of what's going on uh, with COVID-19 and the challenges associated with getting a vaccine out. I think uh, a, a lot of the timeline that's been expressed is about one year. And that's that's a rough approximation, and that really is a fast track for most therapies. Again, when you look at the entire spectrum from phase one to phase three for clinical trials, you're talking about a solid decade before a treatment could actually get FDA approval before it's distributed to the masses. And once we do that, uh, and this is part of phase four, once it's been released to the general population, we start looking at any adverse reactions, we get surveys, feedback from patients who are taking these drugs, and there's a lot of rigorous and routine inspections uh, around the manufacturing process and how these drugs, again, are delivered to patients. Across the entire process, we have to ensure that, again, safety is number one, and the, the piece that ties in with that is the, the approach that we take in manufacturing, which is referred to as GMP, or Good Manufacturing Practices. A lot of these, again, are laid out very clearly uh, in regulations that are put forth by the FDA. In the gene therapy space, because it's very new, a lot of the, the content that the FDA puts out is somewhat generalized in order to allow some of these new pharma companies that are producing these therapeutics to establish the criteria. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a cooperative relationship between the FDA and these companies that are targeting these therapeutics all for the joint purpose of trying to get these out to patients as soon as possible. But this, again, this is the process by which we do it. Normally takes about a decade to get a, pro uh, a project from initial discovery into the hands of patients. Again, 10,000 foot view of the industry here in terms of the number of FDA approved drugs uh, by comparison, and this is looking at the spectrum of more protein-based therapeutics, which again, uh, historically comprise the bulk of a lot of the drugs that are taken uh, intravenously, that are taken uh, subcontinuous injection. Say folks like who suffer from a mess have to take a, a needle in the arm. And this is a protein-based therapy. A lot of these, again, comprise the bulk of the market. And you're talking about thousands of drugs, thousands of drugs that apply for an initial drug discovery, uh, that go through rigorous review and then get approved by the FDA. And you can see this just is just exponentially growing uh, over time. The unique challenge here, though, considering that every step of the way, a lot of these drugs can get shot down. Some of it tied to safety, primarily a lot of it tied to efficacy and the ability to demonstrate effectively that we can correct a patient's disorder. So this is just a brief graph here showing you attrition rates. And you can see from early phase one to phase two, from the time you get from phase one to final approval, one in 10 drugs will actually make it through. So that's why if, if, if you hear about a lot of um, companies that are, that are hot to get a drug to the market, the challenges are, are real, they're very big. And even though we have promising therapies, again, based on the timeline, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to invest 
in doing these clinical trials, to do process development, to get these drugs into the hands of patients. And even after all that, one in 10 are actually going to actually make it to the market. This presents some unique challenges, especially with cell therapies, because again, historically, a lot of the work that's been done has been centered around protein-based therapies. Proteins are very, very small molecules. In terms of uh, shelf life and robustness, they're a lot easier to work with compared to some of these larger biological entities when we start talking about our vectors, especially about cells. You can imagine these living things have a very limited shelf life. Not only that, there's a lot of variability that goes into how we take these therapies and then translate them into a treatment for patients. Uh, this is just quoting from an article uh, referencing uh, aspirin. If you consider aspirin, uh, if you were to buy aspirin at a pharmacy at CVS in South Philly versus an aspirin in Colorado, say, you can be guaranteed that the efficacy and the reaction that you have to that aspirin is going to be relatively consistent. And that's a lot of that's baked into the manufacturing process. But here now we're throwing in some variability, factoring in uh, just the inherent biological nature of things like cells. They can be finicky. In terms of how pharmaceutical manufacturing companies and what are called CMOs or contract manufacturing organizations, which I currently am a part of, this is sort of what we look at. Uh, it all comes down to logistics. How do we manage programs, again, to deliver these therapies to patients? And there's a lot, again, that goes into this. There's a lot of science for sure, but once, you know, separate from the science piece of it, we have to look at the logistical piece because there's a lot of raw materials that go into manufacturing these. Uh, again, because we're working with living materials, there's a very short shelf life. So the timeline to actually process these and deliver these as a, a package therapeutic to patients is very, very narrow. So we have to be able to work expeditiously in a very limited timeline. Part of that release criteria is rigorous testing around these therapeutics. Again, safety first for the patients. So that's a huge Point on the list for us to really look at testing to ensure that what we're generating here is not going to harm the patients. And, and a huge piece of facilitating this is sort of kidding and staging. This uh, graph you see here on the right is just giving you an idea in terms of the, the timeline and the logistics in terms of raw materials, how we order things, and how we can fit that in effectively so that we can hit the ground running with as minimal air as possible when we go in to manufacture these and to deliver these as a final product to a patient. And even when we dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's, still we may not be successful in the clinic. This is derived from an article here, just bullet pointing some of the reasons why some of these therapies may fail clinical trials. Some of it is tied to how we design the trial in itself. What are the endpoints? What are the goals that we're trying to achieve? Uh, perhaps we're not targeting the right patient population, but a lot of it, a huge portion of it, is tied to discontinuity between how we approach things from a research scale and then how we translate that into a manufacturing space. So, just to take a step back for a second and think about food, for example, like orange juice. How does that orange juice get to the grocery store in a lovely little packaged bottle, right? There's an assembly line. Uh, there's a lot of automation, automated systems that are built in that take the raw materials, process them, and then ultimately package them in a lovely little container and put a little Tropicana label on it to go onto the grocery shelf. Very similar type of approach to, to the pharma industry, but because there's a lot of FDA regulation around it, there's a lot of controls that are put in place to ensure that we don't get any kind of contamination and that if there are any deviations in the manufacturing process, that we have a long trail of documentation around that to ensure the safety, again, that being the number one priority of our patients. So really looking at the, the process from small scale to large scale, how does that translate? And that's where I personally uh, am involved in this whole 
mix of elements that go into uh, delivering therapies. So my focus, again, is really on the process development side. How can we take something from a research scale and translate it into a manufacturing process? So there's definitely a lot that goes into that. And being able to streamline that kind of approach is really, really, really challenging. Again, considering that, and this goes back to the uh, allogenic versus autologous approach, if we have a one size fits all, well, then we can establish um, a consistent manufacturing approach around that one size fits all. If we're talking about custom work, well, that means we have to generate or design custom manufacturing approaches that are specific to the, that patient and how we treat those, say, for example. So one of the first things that I do, and this, again, is getting more into the work that I do specifically, we have to identify what are our critical quality attributes. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about being able to effectively recover these drug therapy products as we're processing these. So again, a lot of these are being derived from a biological resource. So using the analogy of a, a fermenter for making alcohol, like a brewery, instead of uh, producing alcohol, we're using cells to produce viral vectors or other uh, biological entities that go into making up a therapeutic. So we have to then isolate that therapeutic from that cell culture media. So there's a number of unit operations or steps that we take that we employ that can have an impact on these, what I'm calling critical quality attributes. Again, we're looking at things like recovery. We're looking at things like residual components that we don't want to have present, that we have to show clearance of in order to provide a measure of safety in delivering these drug substances to patients. A lot of that requires us to really lock in a process for how we grow these cells in a bioreactor, what we refer to as an upstream approach. And then my focus is more on the downstream side. So once we receive that cell culture material, we have to be able to design what I'm referring to as unit operations, which employ uh, various things like filtration techniques, separation techniques that allow us to isolate that therapy of interest. And then in conjunction with that, we have to design what are called formulation strategies. So all of these exist in an aqueous or a, a water solution. And in order for these things to have a decent or reasonable shelf life, just like the orange juice on the shelf at the grocery store, we have to make sure that they're formulated in such a way that there are, say, preservatives or elements that are present in that aqueous solution that ensure the integrity and the lifespan of those products. And then we have to do what's called um, an FMEA or a failure mode analysis. So we can have a small process put together. And then once we establish this process, we have to go through with a fine tooth comb and look at where are the pain points, where are the points that we could potentially introduce risk when we take this small lab scale process and then expand it and blow it up into a manufacturing setting because the challenges then become different. So we have to have an idea and an understanding of how that scales, how that translates. And before we even step foot in the lab, effectively identify what are those weak points and then design mitigation strategies around those. This is all part of what goes into every single drug, developing these drugs. And part of that too is establishing what I'm calling a second source. So once we've established a way of uh, processing, we have to also consider, and again, this is more tied to logistics here, Say if there's raw materials that we're short on, that maybe we didn't anticipate there being a shortage of for some reason, but we're not able to get raw materials from another supplier, how do we manage that so that we stick to our timelines and again, be able to hit our targets? So being able to provide a second source. And I have a little illustration at the bottom here that, that really just talks about two different approaches. One's called scaling out, one's called scaling up. And the, really the big difference here is scaling out would be if you had a small scale approach and then you just did multiples or replicates of that, that's scaling out. So the process parameters translate because essentially you're doing the same approach. You're just doing multiples of that, but eventually you'll hit a ceiling in terms of manufacturing. So thinking of like baking a cake, you can only bake so many cakes before it becomes unreasonable depending on the demand that we then have to look at scaling up. So changing the unit volume for each operation to a larger volume 
And by doing that, yes, there are challenges with that because now we're taking a slightly different approach, but this gives us much more room for capacity and allows us to manufacture at a much more cheaper cost comparatively. So even though I know a lot of patients can empathize, people who are on drug therapies who complain about how expensive it is, uh, trust that uh, some of the, 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 the expense is certainly tied with the drug itself. Some of it's the administration of that drug, but know that the pharma companies actively work at trying to reduce those costs as much as possible. And that's a lot of what my personal goals are uh, in the work that I do. But just to give you an idea, again, in terms of the, the resources, the human resources that are required to pull this off in any kind of pharma company that's manufacturing, and this is certainly the case at Wuxi, yes, you have those core teams that are actually growing those cells, that are designing the processes to isolate the therapeutics from those cells, but then you also have uh, a strong quality assurance team that's ensuring that the raw materials that are going in have been tested as well as testing of the final drug material. Of course, tied in with that is environmental monitoring. So the space in which we do manufacturing, which you can see from the visual on the left here, anyone who steps into an FDA-regulated GMP manufacturing environment has to gown up. So we have to change into scrubs, hair nets, everything, because we want to make sure that we're not potentially contaminating materials. But part of that involves environmental monitoring where people literally go around, they swab surfaces to test for bacterial growth. That's a huge component of it. And then just stepping even further back away from that, metrology and facilities. So everything from providing electricity to clean air, it's a huge piece in making sure that these manufacturing facilities are running effectively, in addition to QC testing for sample release, and then of course supply chain to make sure that we can secure these raw materials in order to actually do the manufacturing. Uh, just to give you an idea in terms of the timeline here, so I showed in the previous slide a timeline of what it takes to get the drug from initial discovery to market. In terms of where my focus is in the development phase, and because we work with clients in the pharmaceutical industry, we have to be able to relay these timelines in a way, knowing that um, these, these uh, companies are really pushing to get these drugs through a pipeline. However, we have to temper that with the reality that it takes time to do development work. In order to establish a process that's reasonable for us to hit our targets, usually takes about a good solid year. And a lot of that involves not only the process development, but again, the testing that goes with that, both testing and material acquisition. And just to mention briefly too, in this day and age, certainly having the ability to do Zoom and Skype, a lot of companies, what we're seeing now, the emergence of a lot of pharma companies that are uh, more on the virtual side. So most of these folks operate out of the home office. They meet either through Skype or Zoom to, to interact directly with these contract manufacturing organizations. And that also too helps to bring down a lot of costs associated with managing a facility. But then that presents a lot more challenges because now you're that much further withdrawn from the actual lab work. So we have to make sure that when we're working with clients or folks who are in the pharma space, design these processes that, that we establish some sense of leadership and direction for these guys in order to steer them in the right direction so that the data that we're generating in the lab makes sense and re is reflective of the efficacy of these products. All in all, it takes, again, a lot of different systems to work cooperatively, to coordinate, as you can see, based on the timelines and the number of resources that are involved. Ideally, we all work collectively together to help push these, these therapeutics through the pipelines for these uh, pharma clients, all with the goal of delivering these therapeutics directly to patients. That really is the focus. I personally am, am particularly excited to be in this field. Again, gene therapy is very small market. Uh, Philadelphia is sort of the central hub for that globally. And I can only see that, you know, as time progresses that you'll start to see more and more companies expand gene therapy capabilities within the Philadelphia area and abroad. And as this market grows, we'll be able to develop new innovative approaches and strategies to, to deliver these therapies in a way that's more cost-effective to patients. Mm -hmm.
So again, just to cap the presentation, really, again, the whole focus is on patients. Uh, just a few examples of some of the, uh, the gene therapy that has been successful. Emily Whitehead, who actually was treated here in Philadelphia at CHOP for cancer using an autologous, again, this is derived from her cells, her own cells, autologous cells, for cancer treatment. And this is back in 2012. She was given this gene therapy treatment, and, and uh, ever since then, she has been 100% in remission. A very similar case with Layla Richards, who also received a similar gene therapy treatment for leukemia, has been in remission. So we see the value and the immense impact that these therapies have for patients. And I think moving forward, that you'll only see this gene therapy market start to grow and expand exponentially. In terms of next steps, where, where do we see the future of this? I think the, you know, it's, it's kind of limitless at this point, considering the capability of being able to augment a patient's uh, genetic material you know, within with their cells. Um, we're looking at techniques like CRISPR. CRISPR is actually uh, an acronym, but it refers to an approach that allows us to identify very specific sequences within a patient's cell or within the genetic material within the cell to go in and edit at the site of the patient's cell, edit the genetic material. There's a couple of the different approaches. One of, uh, one of those includes uh, limb regeneration as a potential a gene therapy application. And again, like I said, I think uh, you know, they're, they're limitless, really based on the, limited to the imagination of, of uh, the scientists and the engineers who are designing some of these technologies. So I guess with that, uh, I thank you for your time and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you so much. That was really very interesting. Um, I learned so much. Uh, there was a lot I, I did not know. So um, thank you for sharing all of that really incredible information with us. Um, just a couple questions. Um, sure. I noticed that a lot of people that you talked about and cited were children. Are these uh, types of therapies only being um, developed right now for children? Um, is that you know, is there a reason behind that? Is it because that they're, as children, I guess, more easy, easily, I don't want to say manipulated, but being, you know, respond to that as a child versus being an adult when you're kind of already sort of matured and developed and they're still developing? Um, that's the question. <laughs> no, certainly not. I think the cases that were highlighted here, and, and there's certainly a lot more cases that I, I didn't touch on, um, I think because of where these viral vectors or these gene therapies are coming out of, like I mentioned, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So that's where a lot of these are being generated from. Again, CHOP and UPenn are really focused on designing gene therapies or viral vectors specifically targeting orphan diseases uh, in addition to a lot of the, you know, the, the, the more ubiquitous type of illnesses like cancer. But uh, no, I think it's just, just for the location here, right? So we're coming out of it. They're being generated out of CHOP, the, 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 the patient population primarily are children in that case, but certainly like in the case of Jimmy Carter, who, you know, what he's like 90 something now, and it wasn't, you know, just within the past, uh, five years, I believe that he actually received, um, gene therapy treatment for melanoma. So it is, does not distinguish between age. It's not an, like an age distinguishing type of treatment. Great. Um, you used that phrase again that I actually wrote down um, to ask you about earlier. You talked about orphan diseases. What's an orphan disease? Well, orphan disease is really something that affects a very small population. So again, something like, like you talk about cancer or diabetes, right? I mean, I don't know what the statistics are around those, but it's probably like one in 10 or something who have that. Now we talk about orphan diseases. These are much more rare. So you're talking about maybe a thousand people out of maybe a population of a million that maybe have this, but it's a very, um, how should I say, um, the, the, the impact in the patient's quality of life is so huge. Like these are life debilitating type illnesses that I think the value there in targeting these um, orphan diseases is, is you know, allows the, the opportunity for expanding the capabilities of gene therapy, because a lot of the, the treatments that are out there right now, again, they're based more on a, a platform around therapeutic proteins, which treat the illness or the symptoms. But now we're looking at targeting the actual source of that illness and then modifying it to completely eradicate the illness. Okay. Um, and it, 
didn't really talk too much about cost. Are these kind of treatments really expensive? Is that a reason why? I mean, they just sound so great. I'm like, why are, why are we all doing this? I know some of it's clinical trials. You explained that. But then I'm also like, is this just crazy expensive? And it's something we can't do right now? Yeah, so that's one of the limitations. So even though if I go back to that list of FDA-approved gene therapies, and it's specific to the gene therapies, um, cell therapies, again, in terms of how uh, we process those, there's, it's, 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 a lot of it's actually done in the hospitals, but the gene therapy, there's a lot of steps involved. So we have to make a viral vector. We have to get patient cells. And then there's a number of other steps that go into that before we even get to the patient. So all of these steps, and a lot of it is actually tied in with the administration of these in the hospital, that adds a huge chunk uh, uh, of change to, to, you know, actually administering these drugs. So the one that was, um, it's, it's Lex, not Lexterna, but Zolgems, I think it is. It's, it's the uh, spinal, um, men in, which one is it? It's, it's, it's for spinal disease, but it's, it's, it's on the list earlier. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> But that, which just got FDA approval this past year, uh, it costs about a million dollars right now. And so, yeah, it's quite cost prohibitive. And so you don't really see a lot of people who are running to, to get these therapies. A lot of these treatments right now are reserved for terminal patients. So patients who have no other option but to take that drug. And once they've demonstrated that, now it's about going back to the drawing board and figuring out how can we bring down our our costs. So some of it, a lot of it's tied in with the manufacturing of it. Uh, but then there's a lot of, again, a, additional steps in between the pharma companies and the administration of this drug in the hospitals that we have to look and see how can we cut some of those costs out. So in your job, what, what exactly, where, where on this do, do you fall? What, what, what is the kind of work you're doing um, involving this? Is it in that early development stage? Is it in, like, do you work in clinical trials? Like, where, where do you fall? Good question. So going back to some of the slide content, again, my focus is really after that really initial uh, discovery phase. So once you can imagine there's, there's, there's some guy in a lab coat sitting in a lab with a microscope and a Petri dish, perhaps, who discovers an indication for a therapeutic and says, aha, hey, this looks like we we're getting some positive response. A lot of that starts with um, small scale studies, oftentimes using animals. They do animal testing, all the drug therapies, which I mean, I'm not a particular fan of it, but that's just part of the process. They again, look at things like toxicity and efficacy. If there's uh, a positive response in an animal model, then they can take that drug and then file an IND, an initial drug discovery. Once they get the IND filing, that's where I step in. So we have a potential therapeutic. Now we got to figure out how can we take this research scale lab approach, which we're talking about really small volumes and being able to translate that to like thousands of liters of material. So a lot of what goes into that is first developing a process using some of these technologies, like I mentioned, like filtration. Uh, it's all separation-based technologies. Chromatography is a big one. That is a big word. but. Uh, <laughs> These, that's where I step in. So I do a lot of optimization and designing for filtration and chromatography applications. And then once we bake something in that looks like it's working and we get a lot of data back from, we have a separate group that does testing to confirm indeed we're hitting our critical quality attributes, then we can take that process and then do what's called a tech transfer where we down basically do download and transfer that into a manufacturing space. So all the sort of protocols and approaches that we take, we train manufacturing people, we educate them, we capture detailed information and in, in batch records and documentation that then they execute to as a protocol in manufacturing to then deliver these drugs for fueling clinical studies. So all the clinical material that goes into phase one, phase two, phase three, that all has to come from a GMP manufacturing space. And that doesn't happen until I do my job. That's very cool. Well, um, thank you so very much for talking with us today about this. This is really great. Um, I'm going to let everybody know if you have additional questions that you would like to ask, please feel free to email them to me at msavedra.com.
at chestnuthillprez.org. That's M-S-A-A-V-E-D-R-A at chestnuthillprez.org. And I will happily pass them along and uh, Eric can answer them. Thank you so much again for joining us, Eric. We really appreciate it. Well, and thank you for your time and thank you everyone for listening.